Hey y'all, so I hate to break your heart right here, but no penguins in this video, I know. Um, it's gonna be very different in this video from most other things I'm showing you, so expect more penguins in the future, but this one's not gonna be very many penguins, actually no penguins. But before that, I just have one quick note. So New Zealand's original language wasn't English. The Māori people were here well before English arrived, and for that reason, I'm trying to go by the proper names of places and species and all that uh, here in New Zealand. It's an adjustment and can at times be difficult to remember, but uh, I'm going to be trying to do my best from now on to use those traditional names. And I just wanted to clarify a few of them that I'm going to be using a lot so that you don't get confused whenever I'm saying a different name than you were expecting. So first off, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Aotearoa is the te reo Māori word for New Zealand. So whenever I say that, you know I'm talking about New Zealand. And then Auckland, the place I live, the university I go to, uh, and the biggest city in New Zealand is Auckland, but in te reo Māori, it is Tamaki Makaro. So whenever I say Tamaki Makaro, I'm referring to Auckland. And likewise, for the University of Auckland, it's Te Whare Wananga o Tamaki Makaro. And then for some of the, the species that I'm going to be working with quite often, so we have the Great Faced Petrel, and that's the Oi. I've already been pretty good about calling them Oi, but again, trying to be more consistent on it. And then we also have the Diving Petrel, or the Kuaka. So Kuaka is a Diving Petrel. And then the Little Blue Penguin. So even just the word penguin brings joy to my heart, but their name is a Corora. So whenever I say Corora, you know that I mean the little blue penguin. So just wanted to clarify a few of those words and make sure you guys understand what I mean whenever I say them. Hey guys, you might notice that my office has changed a bit. Today I'm talking to you from the Waipua Forest. So the Waipua Forest is this really amazing spot. I'm just going to be here for a day on the way up to Tafernui. We're going to be doing some more penguin work this weekend at Tafernui, the place that I did the first field trip, and this is just a stopover on the way there. So the Waipua Forest, is a pretty distinct place. There's two really interesting things about it, and I have two more other things I'm going to show you while we're here. So the first thing about Waipua Forest is it's currently undergoing a disaster. Yeah, a, a real disaster, extinction level issue. There's a disease in these trees, these kori trees, called kori dieback, and it's fatal 100% of the time. Every time a tree contracts it, they die. And kori is a very historic, a very important, and a very endangered species of tree. So why is it historic? Why is it important? So to the Māori people, the indigenous people of New Zealand, uh, the original inhabitants of New Zealand, the kori tree was a very significant piece in their, in their beliefs. It has skin very similar to a whale's, and for that reason it was thought that uh, the kori tree was closely related to the whale. They exchanged skins, and uh, it was a role that was played in many of the different uh, Māori stories. Another important thing on the, the kori tree is it produces this sap, this gum, that's a very important ingredient in many house building materials, in waterproofing canoes and buckets and your houses and everything. It's a very important tree, but it's endangered by this kori dieback disease. It's transmitted very easily, mostly by humans, in fact almost entirely by humans. There was virtually no issues with kori dieback spreading until humans started, you know, walking around in different forests and wanting to see all the different forests. When it was just a local thing, the local Māori people, would be just walking around in their own forest. So if there was an outbreak, it would be a bit more local. Whereas now, because we have cars and trucks and planes and everything, we can go way across, and if a tree way up in the far north of New Zealand contracts Cardi dieback, and a tourist goes there, picks up a little bit of soil that's infected with that, and it goes way down to the south, they can start another outbreak there. So because of that, they're closing off large parts of this park, and anyone that's visiting has to clean their boots, their tent, their tires, everything they bring with them that could have picked up soil. You need to clean it, uh, disinfect it, make sure that you're not carrying kori dieback. And because of that, tons and tons of different parks and trails and forests all over New Zealand are having to be closed off indefinitely until we find out uh, how we can stop it. Because there's no cure for it, so for right now it's just halting the progression of the disease. And then another one, and I think this might be more interesting than tree diseases to you, is this is a kiwi breeding ground. Yeah. So kiwi don't breed so successfully on their own, it's quite a low percentage. And so the Department of Conservation and the Auckland Zoo and Wellington Zoo and a lot of different groups here in New Zealand are working together on a project called Operation Nest Egg. So what they do is whenever a kiwi lays an egg, they take the egg and bring it into an institution that's able to breed it more successfully. And because of that, Institutions here in New Zealand have bred hundreds and hundreds of kiwi that otherwise might not have hatched, probably wouldn't have hatched, and it's a huge part of the recovery of the kiwi. So, I've got a few cool things I'm going to be showing you in the forest. You might know some whispering, and that's related to those kiwi. 
it's about to get dark and I might be seeing a kiwi. Let's hope. If you're wondering what was so special about those trees, the Gordy trees, that's two of them behind me. That one looks like it's at least 100, 150 feet tall. I couldn't possibly wrap my arms all the way around it. Okay, so you guys probably all know what a fern is, or at least you've seen one before. They're usually pretty low to the ground, and they have very wide leaves. They just kind of look like unusual flat plants. Yeah, not in New Zealand. Uh, there are trees here. This is one right behind me. It's about 15 feet tall, and it's a tree fern. That's what they're called. They're called tree ferns. And there's nothing anywhere else in the world anything like them. They're literally just a fern that looks like it's got a palm tree's trunk going up it. And again, like, I'm tall, and I'm nowhere near where the leaves start. Pretty incredible. So does anyone know the national symbol of New Zealand? It's not a kiwi, as you might think. It's not an orc or a hobbit, as you also might think. It's a fern. Seems kind of lame, right? But actually, the silver fern is one of the most feared symbols in world sports. It's the symbol of the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, and they are amazing. They're the most successful team in the history of sports, with a win rate of 89% since the sport was invented over 100 years ago. And that's playing against the best teams in the world. And so, why did they choose a fern? Seems really random, right? Well, it's another thing that's very distinct to New Zealand. It's covered in ferns. Pretty much only see this many ferns in Jurassic Park. And this one in particular is quite distinctive. It's another tree fern. And this one. It just looks like a standard fern, right? Until you turn it upside down. And then it's bright silver. That might not be coming through because it's dark. But that is very bright silver. You can probably see it better on these branches. And they're practically glowing. It's nighttime and they are bright, bright, bright. I don't know if it's picking up in the video, but you're hearing an owl. The owl is called a more pork. You're not hearing that wrong? More pork, as in, I'm hungry, I would like to eat some more pork. Why is it called that? Well, because it says its own name. It thinks it's a Pokemon. It just sits around saying, more pork, more pork. I think one is sitting right above me, but these are quarry trees, so they're quite far up. I can't spot it. 2.30 a.m. There's a kiwi outside. It's been calling for the last, like, 15 minutes. Uh, another one seems to be responding to it from across the valley. But, yeah, it's been a kiwi calling. Still no sightings. They're very sneaky. But keep me an eye out the, out the tent flap. So one of the first questions I had for field work out here at night and long extended stays and things like that, probably the one you might be thinking is, is it safe to walk around at night like this? Is it safe to be out in the wilderness like this? And actually, yeah, New Zealand has nothing in it that can kill a human. Very few things that can even injure a human. It's, um, it's kind of odd, especially after being in Texas where, you know, there's snakes everywhere and scorpions everywhere and you have to be a bit careful and you generally don't sleep on the ground and stuff. Um, and then South Africa, like everything was dangerous. Uh, Alaska, you couldn't have any food out because bears will come for you. Um, I mean, even Ireland, you had goats bothering you if, if you slept somewhere at night or were wandering around. But here in New Zealand, there's basically just birds. There's nothing really that's gonna bother you. It's, um, it's quite strange. It's morning now. And check out this fern tree behind me, or tree fern. The light's messing with the leaves, but that thing's got to be a good 30 feet tall. And the leaves are hanging down probably another 10, 15 feet themselves. So that was the seventh largest quarry tree in the world, and it was closed off for exactly the reason we've been discussing, the quarry dieback. However, right here, we have the Four Sisters. Oh, it looks like it's reversed in the video. Uh, the Four Sisters are four of the ten biggest quarry trees in the world. One is right here. It's gigantic. That's got to be at least 100, 150 feet as well. And there's three more right here along this path. You see how distinctive this bark is? And that's the reason that it was thought to be whale skin that was exchanged with the trees. Pretty distinct bark. Look, this one even has a secondary set of plants growing up there. It's so big that it's growing its own habitat up in the branches. I think if we got two or three people, we still couldn't wrap our arms around this. It's incredible. Three or four, four or five maybe, I don't know. It's, it's a huge tree.
Hey guys, how's it going? I'm on a beach somewhere in New Zealand. Um, there's not GPS service up here, so I needed to find a camp for the night, so I just pulled up to the nearest beach I could. Yeah, pretty cool spot. Um, so actually, right after I got here, a few locals were heading out to go grab dinner. Um, not at a restaurant, not a supermarket, in the ocean. Yeah. Um, so they're looking for what's called a kinner, or in English, a sea urchin. This thing. And as you might guess for a sea urchin, they're in the sea. So you have to go out there, dive down, pull back some seagrass, and you'll find a kinner. Um, so what are they really? This is what they look like on the inside after you've eaten them. Uh, you kind of shake out this like black mucky stuff, and then there's some like orange pasty muscly type thing, kind of like like a, um, like a mussel or a clam or something like that. It's really tasty, and you just eat it raw. And they're all over the rocks here. Yeah, so that was dinner today. It's quite a quite a fitting dinner for a place like this.